David Ronsley. I work for JISC. Um, if you don't know JISC, JISC are um, large um, educational IT provider. We provide IT services across universities, uh, colleges, schools as well now. Um, we do things like Janet, which is the network that uh, all the universities run on. Um, I've been involved with aggregate data now since about 1995, um, starting out on census data, but uh, recently moving on to international socioeconomic data. Um, I'm going to apologize now. This is a bit of a dry presentation. There's a lot of information here on, on uh, data that we hold. Um, bear with it. At the end, I do a quick demo. Um, so just the light of the proceedings. Um, so we have um, data from sort of gold standard international um, organizations, um, IEA, United Nations, uh, World Bank, um, OECD, uh, and the um, International Monetary Fund. Um, and the data we hold is aggregate, so it's, it's counts of items uh, at a geographic level, uh, it's mainly um, national level. Uh, um, so uh, counts of items at geographic level, we have a small amount of sub-national level data as well at, at regional level. Um, it's all time series, um, some of it goes back to uh, before the war, I don't think there's any energy data that goes back before the war. Um, but it goes back many, many years. Um, it's updated yearly on the whole. We have some quarterly and some monthly data. And we have some data that is uh, a bilateral flow, so um, movement of, of objects or people, or in this case, um, energy between countries. Um, World Bank data, um, we have the um, World Development Indicators. Um, these are a set of indicators um, designed to monitor how countries are doing, how countries are developing. Um, a whole raft of data on greenhouse gas emissions, uh, 42 different variables, um, access to clean fuels and technologies, access to electricity um, or in an urban rural environment, um, access to alternative and uh, use of nuclear fuels. Um, we've got um, energy production and use, so um, uh, looking at access to electricity um, uh, and whether we're able to use reno renewable forms of um, generation. And we've also got a few items on transportation, so pump price, gasoline and diesel, Air transport, freight passengers, railway lines, um, distance, passengers, amount of goods transported, um, which might be of some use to you. Uh, OECD, um, number of data sets. So in the environment statistic, we've got the green growth, growth indicators, which are a set of indicators for monitoring progress towards green growth uh, to support policy making and inform the public. Um, and that uh, database covers all OECD countries, uh, plus a few accession countries and key partners, uh, including Brazil, China, India, uh, Indonesia, uh, and South Africa. Um, they, uh, these are, indicate whether economic growth is becoming greener with more efficient use of uh, capital and capture aspects of production, which are uh, really rarely quantified in, in your, your, your normal economic models. Um, so CO2, CO2 productivity, so um, for instance, they've got um, GDP per unit of energy related CO2 emissions. Um, energy productivity, they have breakdown of percentage of energy consumption used in agriculture, services, or uh, retail business. Uh, there are 138 variables in that particular data set. Um, a whole raft of other data sets there. I'm not going to go through those, um, other than to say the Structural Analysis Database, uh, STAN, um, that's uh, a bilateral flow of uh, trade and services and goods, uh, includes uh, electricity, gas and water movement uh, between nations. 
um, Unido data. Um, this is the um, uh, the industrial statistics um, standard industrial classification of all economic activities. That's quite a mouthful. Uh, revision four in Stat four um, has details on uh, um, manufacturing or, um, and in that are covered um, cocoa productions, refined petroleum products, etc., etc., etc. Now the meat of it is is the international energy data. Um, both the IEA and the UNIDO data are, are behind a login. Um, it's freely uh, accessible to anyone with a .ac.uk um, login uh, sorry, email address. So if, if you're at any any um, university or research centre, you can access this data, but you just have to log in, that's all. Just keeps the members of the public um, behind the, uh, the firewall. Um, so um, the IEA data, we have a full release for all countries in the world, or all reporting countries in the world in August and September. And then in um, April and May, we get a, an update for OECD countries. Um, CO2 emissions, um, six data sets um, dealing with um, the generation of CO2 and other greenhouse gases um, from uh, electricity and heat generation. Um, uh, there's detailed um, CO2 emissions data by subsector and by product, and uh, the indicators are uh, CO2 related uh, energy and socioeconomic indicators. Uh, coal information, um, another six data sets, um, full balance data for different types of coal and coal products, uh, including uh, manufacturing manufactured gases. Um, the Output values used to convert physical tons of coal, coal products into energy. Um, supply and consumption statistics for different types of coal and coal products, including manufactured gases again, and uh, detailed coal export and import data uh, by country of destination uh, or origin, uh, and, and again by type of product. Uh, electricity um, production, imports, exports, and distribution losses. Uh, production by nuclear, hydro, geothermal, solar, tidal, wind, um, heat pumps, combustible fuels, uh, and the combustible fuels are broken down into uh, different products as well, uh, and, and others. Um, uh, again, detailed exports and, and import data by country of destination and origin, um, monthly balance of um, net electrical supply, and um, net electrical capacity um, by the type of um, energy used to create that uh, supply, that capacity value. Uh, oil information, um, average conversion factors from tons to barrels for OECD countries uh, for 24 products. So for instance, naphtha, um, aviation, gasoline, kerosene, diesel oil, um, uh, and many others. Um, crude supply, um, so crude, supply, crude oil supply uh, and demand. Um, so there's indigenous production, imports, exports, stock, stock changes and refinery intakes. Uh, detailed oil, and, uh, oil export and import data as well by country destination and by type of product. And product supply and consumption in the form of supply and demand balances, gross output, recycled products, uh, imports, exports, transport, stock exchanges, and international marine bunkers. Um, natural gas, again, detailed import export by um, destination origin, and uh, natural gas statistics on production, imports, exports, stock changes, stock levels, and consumption. Uh, renewables. Um, electrical capacity by type of renewable, energy balance by um, product type, uh, flows of production, supply, imports, exports, and aviation and marine bunker stocks. And also uh, energy supply and consumption statistics in matrix form. Um, 
world energy balance and so on. I'm not going to say too much about these. Uh, they can quite often be um, summaries of, of data in other parts of, um, of the IEA data, but um, net calorie fit values, um, energy balances in matrix forms, and 50 energy uh, economic and coupled indicators. Um, the world energy statistics, um, oil demand by type of oil, net calorific values again for conversion factors, and detailed energy uh, use by product. Uh, world energy prices, um, exactly what it says on the tin, um, it's world energy prices. There is some, some sub-national data in this. There are only 15 countries report sub-national data, and that's at a region level. A region, for instance, being New South Wales, California, Texas. And the last one, uh, energy technology research and development. So it's the amount spent in millions of US dollars on different energy research and technology areas. And that's by um, region or by, um, by country. Uh, that is, oh sorry, one last one, sorry, energy prices and taxes. Um, these are um, data sets on um, uh, cost of uh, crude oil importation and exportation, uh, spot prices of various um, markets around the world, and um, energy prices um, by country as well. Oh, and projections, I've got my projections, sorry about that. Um, projections have come in for a wee bit of um, debate recently. They're seen as being um, rather outdated by um, the real world, um, but these are projections of, of coal supplies, um, key economic indicator, indicators and, and energy balances by country. Um, and a picture just to finish, and I will do a quick demo of um, DotStat, which is our interface to all this data. So, uh, DotStat is not a very exciting page. Um, and I will go into the International Energy Data. There's a login there. It will send you to either um, Athens or um, the um, UK AMF. Just log in with your local user ID, and uh, here we have some data. Um, all our, I'm just going to shift my control panel around here, I don't think you can see that. Um, all our data comes with uh, metadata here, the, um, abstract how to um, cite the data, um, and um, detail. Hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't show you my work, work browser. I can't find a way of doing that. It's not, um, it's not in the list. Um, if you go to, that, go to that address, you can have a play around anyway. Um, uh, any questions, um, you can phone us, email us, uh, or we've got um, an online uh, query platform. You can just enter your queries into that. Um, so I think that's probably a good time for me to hand over to uh, Simon Elam. Uh, and he'll he'll introduce you to the SIL project. Okay, thanks, Dave. Uh, um, so, uh, so I'm Simon Iglam. Um, I'm a principal research fellow at University College London, and I'm also director of the Smart Energy Research Lab. Um, so, the Smart Energy Research Lab, or, or SIL, as you'll hear, as refer to it. Um, our vision is basically that it will provide a secure data portal for UK researchers. Um, it will grant access to high resolution energy data and it will facilitate innovative energy research for, for years to come, we hope. Um, and it's complemented by our own kind of multidisciplinary research program. Um, but it is a, a portal that's accessed to the wider UK community. It's a, a five year project started in 2017, ending in August 2022, and um, we got six million pounds of funding from EPSRC, 
and there's uh, seven universities in the Energy Saving Trust in our consortium. I'm not going to go through them all, but I guess the, the other important one, so it's led by UCL, and uh, the other important partner for today certainly is the University of Essex, who take care of some of the outbound data governance, and they're also responsible for developing the, the technical environment, which is what Darren will be um, telling you about in a few minutes. So why do we need soil? Um, it's kind of historically and currently been very difficult for researchers to get access to good quality demand side energy data in the UK. So um, Dave told you about some kind of excellent data sets um, that are a little bit more focused on the, the macro side and a bit more focused on the supply side in general. Um, SIL is very different. We've got a very much a focus on the demand side and uh, very much um, on domestic buildings because that's where um, smart meters are being deployed. We will look in the future at um, non-domestic buildings, but at the moment the focus is very much on, on domestic buildings, people's houses. So um, we recognize that smart meter data could be or should be a game changer um, because it provides access to this high resolution, um, i.e. half hourly um, energy data, and that's that's simply not been available to us as researchers in the past, or extremely difficult to get hold of those data sets. However, there are still some substantial barriers to accessing smart meter data. Um, the the technical environment is quite difficult to build. There's there's a lot of legal um, hoops that you need to jump through, and um, basically it costs quite a lot of money as well. Um, and so that's why SIL was funded by EPSRC to be a central resource for the UK uh, research community. We, they recognised that it would be very expensive and a lot of duplication of, of time, effort and money to um, build different portals if each university was looking to access smart meter data for its own projects. So a central, central resource made much more sense. And um, as I've kind of hinted at, yeah, the, the focus of SIL is enabling research that is really kind of investigating energy demand or consumption or perhaps energy behaviors in domestic buildings. Um, the type of research that requires um, using granular household level energy data. And um, you know, that, that's why um, there are quite a lot of issues with gaining um, access to smart meter data because it's personal data under GDPR, the, the data protection regulations, and therefore could be disclosive, which is why we um, provide access to SIL data via a secure lab setting. So what data do we have? Um, we've got um, or we're providing access to pseudo anonymized data in a secure lab environment, as I've said. Um, and what we've got is smart meter data, so that's daily and half hourly energy consumption data, both electricity and gas, um, where homes have, have both of those uh, meters and both of those supplies, um, which is about 90% of homes. Um, we get the tariff data, so we know um, how much people are paying for their electricity and their gas, and we also have some additional um, technical data that comes off the smart meters, which is very useful to researchers, um, particularly when they're doing this kind of detailed type of analysis that we expect people to be using so for. Um, and the other really key thing is having contextual data. In the past, any smart meter data that's been released uh, has come with very, very limited contextual data. And that, you know, it's the contextual data that really tells you um, a lot about why people are consuming the energy. So the smart meter data will tell you how much um, and, and when, um, but you need the contextual data to try and untangle a little bit about why and what these drivers of energy consumption are. So uh, we currently have a short SIL survey, which is completed by all our kind of participants, which are households, um, and that provides some uh, really useful household information, some socio-demographics, and it also tells us some characteristics of the, the, the physical property of the building itself. So, you know, what the walls are made of, um, what type of boiler they might have, and so on. Um, we also can get access to energy performance certificate data, and we link that to um, the other data we hold in SIL on a, 
on a household level or a building level, address level. Uh, and we can also link in some weather data, so things like external temperature, um, solar irradiance, and, and so on. So a little bit about the, the overall system. So um, everything you kind of see on the left-hand side of this diagram is the smart meter system that's um, being rolled out across, the, uh, across Great Britain. Um, so that's the kind of infrastructure that we're leveraging um, in order to collect the smart meter data and bring it into the Smart Energy Research Lab. So on the, the blue um, box on the left-hand side, that's the home area network. So that's where a electricity meter, a, a gas meter, has gone and been installed in the house. Um, that comes with a comms hub, um, and you also get a, an in-home display, the IHD. So the comms hub then communicates with the DCC gateway, um, or uh, let's put it slightly differently. Um, let's jump to the right-hand side. The research portal network is everything that we're building. So that's our databases, and um, on the far side of that green box, the research portal itself. That's the secure lab environment by which researchers can access the data that we have stored in our databases. Um, our technical infrastructure then um, sends a message through the DCC adapter, the small orange box there, to the DCC gateway and says, can I connect, um, please connect me to this particular um, comms hub so I can collect the smart meter data that's on there and it sends it back through the DCC gateway and back into our system. So the DCC gateway is essentially a secure messaging service um, that allows us to access the smart meters from which we've had consent um, and we collect the data and it comes back and we store it in our database. So um, a little bit of our design framework, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but um, in very simple terms, the data comes in at the top, um, we manage it, we have these two um, research functions, these two principal research functions, which is the observatory and the laboratory, and then we provide um, data out at the bottom to researchers um, via these different um, different areas, I guess, of that, of that output layer. Um, the two research functions, so the, the kind of primary research function that I'm talking about today is the, the observatory function, so that's where we um, will be recruiting um, around about 10,000 homes, which will be representative of Great Britain, and we provide that um, the data sets that I've uh, talked about previously in the previous slide. We provide that to um, researchers, and that's an, on an ongoing basis. So that smart meter data we're collecting every day, um, and so it's a longitudinal observational panel, um, and it's really there for observational studies. So the ethos is that we don't do anything else to these participants. They've um, filled in a short survey. At the beginning, about once a year, we may ask them to um, complete a follow-up survey, but we're not doing any active research, um, which is active to them, um, with those participants. If you want to do an intervention study, um, so you want to test um, whatever it is, whether it's um, a new tariff, you might be testing a piece of kind of smart uh, sorry, a piece of energy efficiency equipment. You might be testing um, the effect of heat pumps or solar um, panels. Then you can do that via the laboratory function, um, whereby a research project can go and recruit its own participants. Um, it might do a randomised control trial um, uh, design, um, and then we can we will collect the smart meter data. Um, for that research project and provide it to you linked in with the other data that you need for that particular research project. So that's the key difference between the laboratory and the observatory functions. Okay, um, just some ideas of the, the type of research that will be facilitated by, um, by CERL. So we have our own research program. Um, I'm not going to go through each of those in detail. Um, but I'll, I'll talk briefly about the top one uh, because it's obviously quite topical. Um, so recognizing the, 
the impact of, of COVID-19 lockdown was going to be um, probably the biggest natural experiment um, since the Second World War in terms of its impact on energy demand, um, we very quickly decided that we wanted to um, study the impact of this, both in the short term and the long term. So we quickly put together a, a survey that we asked of our existing SIL participants, and we sent that out to them to ask them how their, you know, how things had changed. Obviously, people are working from home much more. Um, there might be new members of the household during the um, the, the lockdown period, or there might be fewer people in the house um, because people are self-isolating somewhere else or something like that. And of course, we have the energy data both before, during, and after. So we keep collecting the smart meter data, which um, meant that we were in a really good position, or quite a unique position, to be able to do this kind of detailed um, investigation of the impact of, of COVID-19 on um, domestic buildings and, and households across the UK. Um, as you can see, there's a bunch of other uh, projects there that are part of our research program. Um, but as I said, the SOIL research project, uh, research portal rather, is open to all. So there's lots of other um, potential research that could be facilitated by using the SOIL research portal. There's a few examples of there. There are many others, uh, and these could be your, your projects. So perhaps looking at how socio-demographic factors impact on energy demand profiles, looking at um, fuel poverty, um, looking at the distributional impact of, of switching suppliers or switching tariffs, for example. Um, so a little bit about how we recruit our participants. Um, so our aim is to recruit eight to 10,000 participants, which are uh, our households across Great Britain. Um, to our observatory panel by the end of 2020. Um, I said the, the aim is for that to be representative of Great Britain households. Um, so we do quite a bit of work in terms of stratifying our sample uh, and also looking at the results when we get it back to um, analyze any SKUs. We conducted the pilot phase last year in August and September. Um, and that was, a, again, a stratified random sample to all households with a, a SMETS 2 meter. Um, which is a, a meter that we can actually access via this DCC gateway that I um, showed you in a previous slide. Um, and from that, we recruited 1,700 households. Um, and and that, that pilot phase basically was, was um, pretty successful, did um, exactly what we needed to do to inform then the main phases of um, participant recruitment, which will begin shortly. So wave two um, will go into kind of field work in August and September. And we aim to get around roughly, you know, another 4,000 participants, and then roughly another 4,000 participants in wave three, which will be towards the end of the year, and that'll take us up to our target of uh, around about 10,000 participants. Uh, and the laboratory projects I mentioned, if you're doing a laboratory project, then you kind of recruit your own participants. Uh, you include consent for us to collect the data on your behalf, um, and then we'll we'll collect that data and, and provide it to you. So a little bit about data governance. Um, this is uh, very boring, <laughs> but uh, but very important in terms of cells. So um, it's absolutely fundamental to our development and operation of the research portal that we got this right. And so we've expended a lot of time and effort over the last couple of years making sure that we do. Um, I guess a kind of simplified version, I will call, call, divide this into inbound governance and outbound governance. Um, so in terms of inbound, that makes sure that the data we collect is via informed consent from from our participants, these these households that go across Great Britain that have volunteered to, to provide their data. Um, and that's um, then fully compliant with the Smart Energy Code, um, which is the, the, the UK regulation by which any, you know, that regulates any access to smart meter data. Uh, and we also have to be um, compliant with all the data pre protection regulations, which is GDPR. And then the outbound data governance uh, ensures that, that only projects that have been approved by our data governance board can access data, and they do that via a secure lab using the, uh, the five safe protocols. 
So the biosafe protocols were developed by um, UKDS and uh, alongside ONS, I think. Um, and so that's basically uh, safe people. So all researchers must obtain ONS accredited researcher status before they're allowed to get access. It's safe projects, as I said, must be approved by our data governance board. Safe settings, which is the secure lab environment itself. Um, the safe data, again, we, we make sure that the data we provide to researchers is appropriate for those secure lab environments. And finally, uh, safe outputs, which is any data that's taken out of the secure lab environment must go through statistical disclosure control um, before it's released, so to make sure it's fully anonymized or fully de-identified. De In terms of our data provisioning, so we provide uh, researcher data sets. Um, there will be uh, regular updates to those um, data sets. Um, which will be either on a monthly or quarterly basis. We haven't um, fully decided on that yet. Um, we also put a lot of time and effort into robust data quality assurance. So we provide a data QA report with every release, which will provide a summary for researchers of their data quality issues that can be found in the data. Um, there's no such thing as a perfect data set. What we're trying to get is um, is perfect um, oversight or as good oversight we can of any data quality issues. Um, we add some data quality flags and scores to the, to the data sets and we also add some derived variables um, related to data quality that researchers can use when they come to conduct their analysis. So our first exploratory analysis data set was released in June. Um, the second release will be coming within the next couple of weeks by the end of July. So that adds in more of the smart meter data than was in that first release um, and it also adds some of the other contextual data that wasn't in the first release. Um, in the first release it was only the survey data, in this next release we'll have EPC data and weather data in there as well. And then shortly following the second release of the exploratory data set, um, we'll be doing the first release of the, the kind of permanent collection which is the data that uh, that you guys can access, uh, and that should come in August. And the secure lab environments, uh, so your kind of channel for accessing the data, um, the UK DS secure lab is, is available now, that's the existing uh, secure lab environment. Um, but we'll also be um, develop. well we are currently developing, um, we'll soon be operational, our own research portal, which is um, just a variation on a secure lab environment, or it is a secure lab environment, slightly different to the UK, the existing UKDS secure lab, but run very much on the same principles. So we've currently got a beta version in test, um, which is being tested by the SIL consortium, uh, and the, the full research portal should be available in, in, in August or September. Um, so just a little bit of a kind of summary of where we are now with the project as a whole. Uh, we've established the, the technical infrastructure, so um, the DCC adapter service, um, a portal for our participants to uh, kind of manage their own settings, um, and the, the data ingest and management processes. And, and um, yeah, that's taken an awful lot of time and effort to get the technical infrastructure to where it is now. Um, and uh, following that, they'll be working, or they are currently working on the research portal, which, which will be released soon. We've also had to spend um, a huge amounts of time on, on the data governance framework and establishing a fit for purpose data governance board. Um, as I said, that's, that's kind of the boring stuff that we've <laughs> had to go through, um, but it's been absolutely critical to getting this project uh, up and running. Uh, and finally, uh, the SIL research program is, is underway as well now. Uh, we've got six projects have been commissioned and um, they're in the kind of early stages of, of getting going. But we are a live project, as I said. We uh, recruited 1,700 households from the pilot phase and that, that data has been collected and, and been managed uh, for the last few months. And as I said, that, that first exploratory data set um, has been published via the UK Data Service. 
So the next steps, uh, as previously mentioned, is to recruit the remaining um, participants, the remaining roughly 8,000 participants for our observatory panel. Um, the research portals should be live and released soon. Um, the research program, that, that will be continuing. And the Data Governance Board will start to review um, research project applications um, very soon. They're, they're actually reviewing the first three uh, later this week. So if you have a project and you want to use um, SIL to access data for that project, then um, please start applying or start thinking about your, your project application now. Um, and some just a little bit more kind of information, or if you need more information on SIL, then there's some data uh, or some links to our website there. Um, you can also see some uh, quite detailed information about the data via the UKDS catalog records. So the exploratory data set has got study number 8643, uh, and there's a link to it there. Um, and um, as I say, that, that information will get updated with our second release uh, later in July. So if not all of the documentation you need is there now, it will be within the next couple of weeks. And then the permit collection will follow fairly shortly. And then on the right-hand side there, you've got the, the website address and uh, an email address if you want. Um, if you've got any questions and you want to um, contact us um, after this webinar, please do so. And with that, I'll hand over to Darren. Right, can I just check first that you can see the, the presentation okay? Yes, I can. All right, excellent. So third time, third time lucky. All right, okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name's Darren Bell. I've been the Associate Director of Technical Services at the UK Data Archive since January. And I've been working closely with Simon Elam and UCL uh, as, as the research partners on the SIL project now for a couple of years. Now, I am conscious of time, so I'll try and get through these relatively quickly so we have time for some questions at the end. Uh, but essentially, if you want to be really reductive about the whole Smart Meter Energy Research Lab infrastructure, you can actually boil it down into uh, about six icons. Essentially, we have a central data store, and either side of that, we collect participant consents, uh, because obviously we can't collect data without their consent. Uh, once we've got that consent, we're then actually pulling the data from the smart meters in their households. That's all stored in a central Hadoop cluster at UK Data Archive, and we present that through a researcher portal and onto the researcher. So in a nutshell, although there's a lot more moving parts in, in the system that are represented here, this is essentially what the entire uh, kind of SIRL infrastructure consists of. Okay, so the first part of this really is capturing consents. This was a bit of a departure for the UK Data Archive because traditionally we're a data repository and we're not really involved normally in the full life cycle. Uh, but this has been interesting for us to be involved in both the survey design, capturing consents and, and the whole kind of data management life cycle. So we went live with something called the Participant Portal uh, last August, which was really to capture the initial wave of consents from people. So people come up to the site, uh, if they've received a letter, they'll enter their special code and then register that they're giving their consent for us to capture their data. So once they've actually done that, uh, the data is then stored, uh, their consent data is stored on Amazon Web Services, which is on a cloud uh, environment. So there are a number of moving parts in this. Uh, we use something called Amazon Cognito to capture and store all their encrypted credentials. And the APIs and data storage are all held on Amazon as well. So our approach these days is very much to have a cloud-first uh, environment and infrastructure wherever possible. And this is something we've managed to do with Amazon Web Services. Uh, well, you'll notice it's a serverless architecture as well, uh, because this is the kind of new hot thing. You don't actually have any physical machinery or what we traditionally understand as physical servers or hardware. Everything is effectively abstracted into memory. Uh, so all of these services uh, and all of the uh, interactions between the client and the server end are, are actually don't require any hardware. So the data store at the heart of this is something called Hadoop. Uh, that's a separate uh, webinar to go into what Hadoop is, but essentially it's a big distributed computing environment. 
currently we have uh, about two petabytes of storage available at the archive because of replication and other things uh, there's probably about 1.4 petabytes of usable storage in that so we are expecting obviously tens of thousands of participants over the next 18 months uh, so we do need a good good deal of capacity there so Hadoop essentially is allows us to chain lots and lots of different machines together and aggregate that into one single storage point so the main parts of Hadoop that we're using, because it is a big stack of software, is something called HBase, which is the really core database that allows us to store billions and billions of rows of data. Uh, and it's a very flexible schema, so we can add and remove columns uh, on the fly as we need to. Uh, something called HDFS, which is Hadoop dist Distributed File System, where we store all the original XML files that come into the system before they're changed into database rows. So yeah, it's it's a very uh, a very complex system, uh, but it does allow us to scale up very quickly uh, without having to inject lots of new new hardware all the time. On top of HBase, which is the core data store, we actually use something called Janus Graph. Now, some of you may be familiar with graphs uh, as as a kind of modern database technique. Without going into too much detail, it effectively allows us to query. Uh, interconnected uh, nodes, if you like, so interconnected points of data. So if we wanted to do longitudinal analysis on connected variables, that's something that would be a good good model to use. So we use something called Janus Graph on top of on top of HBase. So uh, as well as the participant portal and the core data store, uh, we also have a system called Apache NiFi, which manages all the data flows going in and data flows going out in a very coordinated and structured way. So this is just one of our uh, schematics for how we manage uh, onboarding participant data. So very briefly in this diagram, the participant will log on to the participant portal, give their consent. At the back end on Amazon Web Services, that sends something called a message, which is basically a small fragment of text uh, that comes back to UK Data Archive. And then we begin onboarding the smart meter data from households on behalf of the user. So once those schedules, as we call them, are set up, uh, that smart meter data is then retrieved overnight, uh, daily. So for every household, there could be up to six or seven different devices, whether that's electricity or gas or smart meter hubs. Uh, so we have 1,700 participants at the moment. In total, we have about 8,000 of these schedules that come in overnight. So. At the moment, we're running about 1,700 uh, participants. As Simon said, we're hoping to scale it up to 10K by the end of the year. So that involves having a system that's very flexible and, and quick to react in terms of scale. So the way this works at the moment is that we chain lots of machines together effectively to function as a single ingest point. And as the capacity needs to grow, we just add in more machines into what's called the load balancer. So we can ingest larger and larger amounts of data without the system constantly falling over and crashing. So building resilience into the system is also important. So we have a number of dashboards and alerting systems that help us keep on top of the data flow. So what you've got here is just some sample screenshots from one of our dashboards called Grafana, which allows us to monitor how much data is coming in uh, at any particular time and where thresholds might be that might incur some kind of alert and tell us to do something to fix the system. So bringing the inbound data has not always been straightforward. Uh, the Digital Communications Company Gateway, or DCC Gateway, is uh, relatively new uh, for people outside of the big six energy companies. So the data itself actually comes in as XML files, uh, and these have to be uh, passed, and you have to go through these in quite some detail and flatten them out. So there have been a number of challenges, uh, duplicate postings that come back from smart meters, often there are missing postings. I don't want to name names on a public webinar, but there are certain smart meter manufacturers who've been more problematic than others. Uh, we have something called alert storms, where we can literally have tens of thousands of alerts coming back for the smart meter. So no data, but it's almost like having to sort the wheat from the chaff. Unfortunately, a lot of these problems have now stabilized and those issues have been resolved. So we have a relatively stable data ingest uh, infrastructure now. So we are now focusing on the front end. I mean, the majority of the project for the last couple of years has been setting up the back end, the data stores, the data transfer mechanisms, uh, the consent and data governance. But now we can focus a bit more on the front end. Uh, the researcher portal uh, is in development. This is uh, one of the early wireframes. Uh, but this is what the actual site looks like at the moment that's under development at the moment. 
So we'll be uh, allowing people to complete all their project applications online and having done that and gone through a data governance board, they'll then be able to retrieve their data through a secure lab environment which is going on the cloud. UKDS Secure Lab, uh, as Simon mentioned, I mean data will be available in there as well, uh, but we are migrating across with a cloud first approach to making sure these secure desktops come in line as well. So in order to keep those secure, we do the usual things, we encrypt the data at rest. Uh, we also have multi-factor authentication as well, which requires you to enter a one-time code. Anyone who's used a banking application will refer to that kind of authentication. So yes, we're working on that actively at the moment, and that should be ready uh, towards the end of August in September as the first minimum viable product. So finally, a few key activities. Uh, yes, we're preparing for wave two onboarding and scaling up for hopefully up to 5,000 households. Uh, we're implementing the infrastructure for those cloud-based secure desktops. I think Simon mentioned as well, we did perform a COVID-19 survey, which closed last week, so we're just ingesting the data for that now, which will provide some really rich contextual data for smart meter readings, along with weather data and EPC data, and working on getting the research report for out for researchers. Okay, so that's it from me. I think we've got about five minutes for questions. So I don't know if anyone has actually submitted anyone at the moment. I'm just looking at the questions portal. Okay, I can't, I can't see the written questions, but if, uh, if you do want to, if you do want to ask a question, by all means, uh, type something into the chat or into the questions element on, on the webinar console. Can I can see something. Can I just ask the first presenter, please? What energy yeah. data are only available by the IEA website and OECD I library? Uh, so I didn't find which library did you say so? Uh, IEA website and OECD library. I think that's one for me. Um, we we take all the IEA and the OECD data, uh, put it in our own platform. So. Uh, all the all the data that is available there is, is available uh, within the DOSTAT, uh, which is our platform. Um, we actually work with the OECD on DOSTAT is um, um, a community-wide platform that um, the OECD uh, develop uh, in conjunction with ourselves and uh, a number of other um, international uh, data aggregators. I hope that's answered your question. Okay, has anyone else got any questions? There was a question about um, a deadline on, project, on the SIL project application, so I can answer that. So there's no deadline. Um, the only uh, constraint or time constraint is that projects must complete by August 2022, which is the funding for the first um, kind of cycle of the of the SIL portal. I mean, we hope it's going to be extended after that, but for the moment, that's that's the only really kind of time constraint. I'd add it does take a little bit of time to get your project applications through quite a, a rigorous process, which is uh, the same process pretty much um, that all Secure Lab um, project applications go through so that you know that's likely to take a month or two and you also need to get your researcher accreditation so if you wanted to start soon then I, I'd advise getting in your project applications fairly promptly um, I think you're also asking can you tell us more about the present 1700 households geographic representation and socio-demographics so yeah so we've um, we've compared our uh, so first of all, we stratified by region and by index of multiple deprivation, so that in terms of our kind of outbound sample, we represented on those um, scores. And then uh, when we got the data back, we were able to compare the sociodemographics of the pilot phase panelists with other sources of information like EHS, in the English Housing Survey, census, and so on to look at any skews in our data. So there were some skews in terms of our sociodemographic representation. But what we're able to do is then in the second and third waves of 
um, of participant recruitment, which is what we're starting wave two very shortly, is um, we're able to oversample for those socio-demographic, for example, um, archetypes where we were underrepresented due to, uh, uh, for example, in terms of the index of multiple deprivation, what we found was that the response rate was lower in the more deprived areas and higher in the less deprived or wealthy areas. So what we can do is then adjust the amount of uh, invitation letters we send out to those regions so that we should get something back, which, is, which will um, ultimately mean that we're, we're very balanced. The only other thing to say about the pilot phase was that Scotland and the north of England were not represented at all in our pilot phase, and that was due to a, a technical issue with the smart meter rollout in, uh, in those northern regions or northern regions of the country, northern regions of the UK. Again, that will be corrected in the second and third wave um, so that when we uh, get to the end of this year, we'll have a panel which reflects the geographic distribution of the UK or of Great Britain. So hopefully that answers that question. I'm just going okay. through this other list of... Uh, there was a question uh, for you, Darren, about Janus Graph and what kind of nodes you're pulling together. Yeah, essentially what we're doing here is we, it's mostly around variable information. Uh, so this allows us to effectively class different types of variables together, either by geolocation or conceptual keywords. Uh, so we have something called a variable cascade. So within any particular data set, there'll be a particular variable. Uh, what we can do is link those variables together between two data sets, if you like. Uh, and link those into concept schemes as well so that we can do kind of traversal between uh, different uh, different variable linkages. Uh, so that, that's essentially what's going on with there at the top layer in the graph. Okay. Okay. So I think there's just another couple of ones here. Uh, uh, there's another question about the application form which I can take for Searle. So, um, the application form for SEARL is all within the UK DS system. So um, what you need to do is register for a UK data service account if you don't already have one. And when you get that, you can um, you set up a new project. And you will then, um, when you've set up your project, uh, which just takes a few minutes, um, within the UK DS system, you then would link to the the SEARL data set. Now, at the moment, it's only the exploratory data set, so you don't want to use, you don't want to link to that. You don't want to bring that into your project. You want to wait until August when the, the kind of full data set is released. So when that happens, you would link your um, project to that data set. And when you do that, you say, I want to use this data for my project. You'll then get all of the steps that you need to complete, including the accredited researcher status, and you'll then get the, the right project application form for SIL. And so that's when you complete the project application form. So it's all within the UK DS system. Yeah, there's another question here I've got from Karen Dennison. Is there any potential to link the data to other data, such as administrative records? Uh, uh, so it, yeah, go on, Simon. Uh, yes, so I mean, uh, well, Darren, you might give the technical answer. Um, in terms of the kind of data governance and the kind of research answer is that yes, there is the potential to do that, absolutely. That's something that we have set up SIL to do. Um, when you link, so I provided before the, the data sets that we've already linked in, such as um, energy performance certificates are actually a, a, an, a, an administrative data set. So that's pre-linked for you. If you want to bring it in other data sets, then that is perfectly possible. Um, you'll put that on your project application form and that will get reviewed by our data governance board just to check that there aren't any particular data governance issues with linking that administrative data to the, um, the smart meter data and the other data that we have, um, providing that's not the case, which usually wouldn't be, um, it will get approved by our data governance board and then you can you can link uh, you can link in that data. And I don't know, Darren, if you want to comment about the kind of technical uh, infrastructure for the way that's enabled. 
Yes, I mean, technically, I mean, obviously that would require some kind of linkage keys that we'd be able to perform those linkages on. Uh, but yes, I mean, that, that would be taken on a case-by-case -case basis, really, as part of any standard project submission. Okay. Uh, so there's another one here. Is there an application form for our CIL projects? Uh, the CIL website only mentions AR status, etc. Yes, so I just, uh, I just covered that. As I said, that's through yeah. the, the UKDS system. Yeah, okay. Uh, so we've got any others then. Is the direct link to the ONS accredited researcher status application? So I, I, I think you mean by that, uh, it, it, well, certainly uh, the accredited researcher scheme, all, all researchers ha are required to have an AR uh, number uh, in order to submit a project. So uh, there isn't, a, if you're talking about a direct a web link or something uh, no not at the moment I think um, well yes yeah, so I'd you can just google the research ONS research accredited uh, research accreditation service RAS but I think there is a link to it on the SIL uh, web page if you go to the researchers tab or researchers page on the SIL website there is a link to the ONS um, research accreditation service there Okay. So and have some more information on, on, on the on the process. All right, there's another one here, Simon, about how long in advance do I need to register an account to access the SIL database? Um well, once you've submitted your project application, we usually say that's about four to six weeks um in uh, before that project would get approved. Um, but you also need to do some work before submitting your project application. You need to get any research. You need to get um, approval from your university research ethics committee, as you do for any research involving um, human participants. Um, the fact that we've got their energy data means that this is research involving uh, human participants. So, I mean, I, as a rule of thumb, I would. I would start the process two to three months, probably three months before you actually need, want to start analysis and actually start using the data. Um, the research accreditation process, you need to go on a training course and pass an exam um, and you need to get your um, project of view. And it's a very, you know, it's a deliberately a very rigorous process that um, the UK data service have, have um, developed over many years for for all secure lab projects so um, there you know it, it, it does take a little bit of time so I, I would as a rule of thumb I'd allow yourself three months um, before you start wanting using the data to get the project approved to get your ethics approval and to to get your research accreditation okay all right I'm very conscious of time now so I think we'll, we'll have to wrap up there okay